Okay, so this is an amazing group of women. I am so proud. I started doing a little research on these ladies. Of course, I know Britt, she's awesome. We invested in her company, they're superb. But I did a little video watching, I did a little reading, and this is an amazing group of women. First of all, I mentioned to you earlier, the theme for tonight is CEO lessons, building a billion dollar company, a billion dollar company. Okay, so Julia, they've got over a billion in revenue. It, well, Come so, on. So we've processed over eight billion in gross ticket sales and we powered 2.4 million events last year. We actually don't share our revenue numbers, but. <laughs> It's impressive. So I'm going to take your number, I'm going to raise it by eight, and then I'm going to do a lot of vagary. Eight billion. Eight billion. The last I heard from Miriam, they don't disclose this information, but I'm a little sneaky, so I went out looking. And I know the last I heard from you, Miriam, nine figures? Yeah. Nine yes. figures. Nine <laughs> figures. Yes. That's as close to a billion as you get, right? Pretty darn close to a billion. And I know Britt, Britt, her company's a little earlier. But Britt is on the path toward a billion. <laughs> many of eight, many eight figures, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and she's got a billion dollar brand, so let's, let's just say that, because she's on every television show, she's an exceptional celebrity, as well as an entrepreneur and CEO. So this is an amazing group of accomplished women. First time we've ever done a panel, we usually have an executive at a publicly traded company come up and talk about their experience, but we want to hear today about these three ladies, and they all have a unique story. I want to start with you, Julia. I think everybody knows Eventbrite, right? If you don't know, you kind of got to know because we use the Eventbrite platform for this event, so Thank everybody you. knows a little bit about Eventbrite. I provided customer support in the makeup room, so I got so some good feedback. Give me just the quick, uh, quick and dirty on what inspired you. I mean. Why did you do this? I know you and your husband and another founder yeah. started it, but give us a little bit of an overview. Well, I was in a really interesting inflection point in my very early career. I was actually 25 when, we, when I decided to leave uh, my career as a development executive in uh, television. I worked at MTV on Jackass. I never miss a moment to say that in front of my mom. And then, uh, I uh, worked at FX on a number of series, Nip Tuck, Rescue Me, The Shield. And I was, I, during that journey, I fell in love, inconveniently so, with somebody who lived in San Francisco. My boss from MTV married his classmate from Stanford, and we were sort of the product of the wedding. And he was working on his second company. Uh, and for two years, I was able to sort of be a fly on the wall in Silicon Valley and he was able to come down to Hollywood and, and reap whatever benefits he reaped from being a fly on, a, on the wall there. But when we decided to make it sort of official and level up our relationship, it really started with the, with the notion of, okay, I'm from here, I'm from the Bay Area, I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, and inherently I understood how valuable it would be to start a family near my parents, which it totally paid off. Um, but I... <laughs> I started with the practical, and then I thought, well, if I really want to continue my career in television, I should stay in LA. But then something crazy happened. This guy named Al Gore and Joel Hyatt started a startup network called Current TV. And it was really the, that outlet that allowed me to consider moving up here and transferring my skills. And so I started on that journey, and it actually took a year to get a job offer from them. Unbeknownst to me, Kevin had prepared a counter offer to that job offer. And so when I was about to take the job, he came in and pitched me the idea loosely for Eventbrite, what became Eventbrite. And he had this quality in his pitch, which I think I now know is self-evident in serial entrepreneurs, they're missing a chip. And the chip is the chip that says something can't work out, like something might not work, like it might be a bad idea, or you shouldn't start a company with your soon-to-be wife, or who has never had an entrepreneurial whim in her life. Um, and so I really appreciated that. But the second thing was just the idea of velocity. I was interested by how quickly things move here, and I was interested in being a part of that. And then I was young and in love. 
and um, he could do no wrong by my parents' standards. So it was a lot of things that came together, but I decided to take the leap, and so I actually didn't end up joining Current TV. I ended up starting Eventbrite, and I moved on a Friday from a window office in Century Plaza or Century City in the Fox Plaza building, um, 42nd floor, uh, to a windowless phone closet in a warehouse in Potrero Hill in San Francisco. And I was pushing the sawhorses into the room to make the desks, because we use sawhorses and plywood, and thinking, he better be onto something, because this is really gonna be a disaster if not. And he, he's really giddy for some reason. And so we literally started from day one. It was just the sort of ground zero of this idea that we had and all the reasons why we shouldn't do it, right? Like nobody should start a company with their soon-to-be spouse. And my visual of that moment in time is um, the sawhorses, the plywood, a lot of cup of noodles because we were bootstrapping the company, and uh, a bunch of wedding invites because I was hand calligraphy. I decided I could do that. It was before the days of Vinted. I was trying to hand calligraphy. Or Brit and Co. <laughs> yeah, girl, you got that. Or Brit and Co. And I was doing that on our wedding invites. It was just like, oh my, everything was happening at once. So. Fabulous. No, that's, that's a great story. And actually, you know, I've been investing for almost 18 years. And it's one of the things that we look at. If, if you have a husband and wife combination, that's generally a yellow flag. And I love that it didn't dis discourage them, even in the slightest bit. And, and it's an amazing team. Well, we hit it head on when we, three years later when we raised capital, actually, we went into the partner meetings and we led with, here's how we have survived the last three years. And our golden rule, which was handed down from us from another co-founding couple, Michael and Sochi Birch, was to divide and conquer, never work on the same thing at the same time. And that seemed to put a lot of people at ease in the, in the VC meetings because we were able to just address it proactively. And so we actually didn't see a lot of resistance to that. Um, but we also, had a, we also had traction. We had three years under our belt. That helps. That helps. Excellent. OK, Maria. So I, I love your story. You need to do a YouTube search on Miriam and hear her talk about her history as an entrepreneur. Right, she started at Eve.com, sold that company. You hear her talk about it, she'll talk about the failure of that as opposed to the achievement of it, which is so unusual in Silicon Valley. How many people do you hear talking about their failures? Any? I mean, it's all up and to the right if you listen to you know, the purveyors of, of culture here in Silicon Valley. But Miriam talks about the failures and what she's learned from them. Now she's at Minted a great marketplace for designers. I want you to tell me, how have you arrived? I mean, what, what kept you going through the difficulties, the challenges, the disappointments? How do you overcome the failure? Well, that's You've a had good more question. success than failure, in my view. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I get really intellectually engaged with the problem. So I, it sort of becomes me in, in, a, in almost like in a, in a little bit of a quiet room, if you will, because I get so into solving the problem that I'm able to forget about what other people think of, about me and be able to shut that out, which I think is important sometimes. I, um, I also, I mean, I, I am an immigrant, by the way. I, I immigrated here in 1980. Um, and I... <laughs> And I think that that, um, that experience puts everything in perspective, honestly, because you face challenges and you overcome them and, and you just keep going, honestly, you just keep going and you get in, and getting engaged actually in my school and grades when I was young really helped me get through a lot of really, kind of a difficult transition to the US. Um, but um, I think for Eve.com, it was a bit of, it was a tale of two startups, Eve.com, I, I raised a lot of money in 98 immediately something like $26 million in a year and a half, and I was, I was young. Um, I shouldn't really have been given any, of, any money, I think. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I raised a lot of money, <clears throat> went through the dot-com boom and then the bust. Um, we sold the company in 2000 right before the, the market dropped, um, but still it was very hard to see the whole market fall apart. 
Um, with Minted, it was very much bootstrap for about, for several years. Many years we raised very little money and we grew the, the company on very little cash. It was a very different experience. Um, but I think what I had learned from the, the Eve.com boom and bust was how much I had to shut out what in the entire market thought of you, because it was so irrational. First you were a hero, and then you were nothing after the bust, like everything, after everything fell apart. So you became uh, really, really much more accustomed to being your own judge, like becoming sort of honest with yourself, and that's really what um, helped me uh, build Minted. That experience. Excellent. Yeah. All right, now Britt. So Britt is riding the wave of the maker movement. She is, I think, a DIY marketplace for the creative. She's gonna tell you a lot about some of the foundations she started, the work that she's doing, but tell me how it got started for you, Britt. Um, sure, maybe I can do this in an interactive way. Um, I like to start sometimes with this, so especially in a room full of women, Raise your hand if you know and feel comfortable with a sewing machine, okay? Raise your hand if you feel fully competent making Thanksgiving dinner for a group of 15 people, okay? That's okay, okay. you guys have done that before. Raise your hand if you feel confident with Photoshop. Less people with Photoshop than, a, than Thanksgiving dinner, that's good to know. Um, in general, uh, Thank you for participating in that. But um, I found um, that uh, a lot of women in the millennial generation, so 18 to 35, actually said that they weren't creative. Um, they, this is the first generation that largely grew up without home at class that was required of them when they were younger and without a mom who stayed home to teach them some of these domestic skills because they largely grew up in the 80s and 90s when women were really empowered to go into the workforce. And I had left my job in tech. I worked at Google and Apple and, and saw this massive gap of um, creative confidence and adult women who were just starting families and just getting married, just buying their first homes. And I thought it was crazy because I'm sure all of you, when you were five years old, had no problem, you know, telling stories, um, playing with Legos, um, you know, playing with your with dolls, building bricks, etc. And, and I don't know what happened. I think something comes down to middle school. I blame everything in life on middle school. Um, but essentially, I think it has something to do with when we were graded in art class. It just felt wrong to me, and I wanted to change it. So Brit & Co. became um, you know, a, a startup uh, and a business whose mission was to help empower women to be more creative. And that creative confidence um, exists in every part of your lifestyle. You're making creative decisions all day, every day, from what you're going to wear, how you're going to do your hair, what you're going to make for breakfast, to things like you know, how you're going to entertain um, guests coming over tonight, and, and if you are going to do you know, some sort of a craft project or, or something on the weekend. Um, today, we are five years in. We reach 125 million uniques every month, mostly women. Um, we create... 100 pieces of content every day. We're one of the biggest um, media companies on Pinterest, um, one of Snapchat Discover's partners, really large on Facebook and Instagram. We have an online uh, classes business, almost 100 courses where you can learn Photoshop, and you can also learn sewing, and you can also learn how to cook and entertain. Um, and we're starting to launch products as well. So um, it's been an incredible road, and, and again, at the heart of it is, is this empowerment of women to do creative things and to be confident in themselves. Um, so that's where we are today. Can I interject? I have, because we actually are really good, <laughs> I have two, I have a story for each of you that I think illustrates sort of, you hear these large numbers, and it seems like yesterday that Britt was coming over for brunch it was well before you had had kids, so you're really interested in our kids. It's like a science experiment. In fact, our daughter was a flower, like a rented flower girl for your wedding. But you brought over these amazing muffins, and they were in this like, in this like sp spray painted chalk tray thing that you had created. And our daughter was dressed as a princess, which was like much to my chagrin, and was totally thought Brit was literally a princess, you know, like a Disney princess, who had brought over these treats. And she was just taken by the experience of these muffins and 
that's when you pitched us the idea, but you told us you were going, you didn't pitch it, you told us what you were going to do. And I sort of sat there and went, oh my God, A, this is the first time that my daughter's seen anything that's like DIY. You know what I mean? Because I am not DIY or crafty. Thanks, Mom. We're B-U-Y. Yeah. B-U-Y, we're B- right? We and, bought. And, and, and B, like, it made so much sense. And I will always think about Brit & Co. in relation to the muffins because they also were delicious. But it was about the whole thing, right? And it, made, it just made sense. And then with you, it was about the year that Minted overtook Tiny Prince, right? The, the, the Christmas win all of a sudden, we got more minted cards than tiny print cards. And I was like, oh, my God. And it's those little things, those little signs, whether it's somebody's conviction that they can do something that hasn't been done before or where you start to see those signs of traction and you experience it in your real life. And so I'll never forget those moments because even though we're wherever we are now, you always remember those tiny little inflection moments. It's true, and, and those moments, I think, have to carry you through the difficult times because there are lots of bumps in the roads and lots of setbacks, but there's lots of inspiration and lots of camaraderie and lots of hope, and you have to remind yourself of those things. And I've, Miriam, I've heard you say that a lot in terms of how you got to where you are now because there were a lot of naysayers for the idea of selling Yes, stationary well, online. Well, a lot of a lot of women's products actually. So yeah. back in '98, when we were when my partner and I um, were starting Eve.com, there weren't a lot of um, being things being sold online, right? And so people didn't. So actually, the number of women shopping online was much much lower than it is now. Um, but we would go out and pitch cosmetics online, and I remember one male VC saying to us, "Women just they just don't shop online." <laughs> Which is really just funny. Just don't do it. They, they, he literally, and it's a very respected firm. Women, Sorry. women don't shop online. Then fast forward, you know, whatever, how many years later? In 90, uh, it, that was '98. Then we started minted in 2007, and then it was people will not buy paper products online. So you know, you just you're going to get naysayed. Your basically your entire life. We just all have to get used to it, right? And. Um, there's just a right moment and a right time for an idea. And it might not be the first time you try it. It might, it might be the second time. It might be, it, so it's just, but you have to um, stick with the vision and see if you can crack the code and, and make it work. Yeah. So, Julia, tell, what does success look like for you? I mean, what are you personally trying to achieve? I, I see a lot of women get into business and, you know, they may not have an end game, right? I mean, it's kind of the idea and the, the energy and the passion around the idea. But do you have an expected end, an outcome that you're looking forward to? All I want to do is talk about these gals. But I, <laughs> how great is it when you create your end of your minted car? I mean, that, that's a visceral feeling I can feel right now. Um, success for me is about what kind of company we are as we travel this journey. And so I've made that very clear to the company, especially now stepping into the CEO role, that, you know, we will be what we will be, and I believe that we are, not to sound so Zen Buddhist, but we will be a valuable company. We have tapped into a market that didn't actually even exist before we were there to enable these types of live experiences to occur. We've ag aggregated many, many different types of categories across many different segments internationally that just, it just hasn't been done before. So we are the number one ticketing platform in terms of number of events and number of organizers in the world, bar none. But that actually, to me, is, it's part of that journey and part of that success. It is far more important to me how we travel the journey together. And I know that sounds kind of esoteric, but believe me, like, that is the success metric, is what kind of culture did we create? What kind of people were we? How did we treat each other? That to me is what's most important. And so, you know, the value will be what the value will be, but what I want my legacy to be is I, I help to create a great company. And that's a little less um, measurable, but certainly you can tell the great from the good and especially from the terrible. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Isn't that good? She's, she's wrote written some, some really great work and, and talked a lot about culture, leadership, about empathy as a leader, 
So I would, I would suggest you check out her LinkedIn page and, and take a look at YouTube. I'm telling you, they've got an impressive background, but I really like those ideas. Uh, most CEOs don't talk about things like culture. It's just results, results, results. Well, the results are produced by the people. The people keep coming back because of the culture. And as the culture is strong, your results are gonna be strong, inevitably, if you've got a good product, right? Amen. All right, so talk to me, Britt, about obstacles. I mean, you started Britt & Co. young. I mean, you're still really young. You're 30, right? 31. 31! <laughs> Early 30s, as I like younger. to call it. Right? Thank you. I'm not that much younger no, than some of you guys. Younger. I'm like the baby everywhere I go. Um, I yeah, started so at 25, that's 25 true. 25 years old, 25 years old. So, and I know, I know Miriam also started Eve when, when she was in her 20s. You too. I mean, the, everybody's in their 20s. So I don't know. Everybody's I get all the hate for being the young one. <laughs> it's cool. So what, you know, as, as you're developing Brit & Co. into a global platform for the millennial female DIYer, and she hates it when we say she's the Martha Stewart of the tech world, but that's how people describe them. Because that's how I'm big never going to jail. This is. Get it on video <laughs> right now. Okay. But that's, that's how big this is going to be. But tell me about how you overcame some of the challenges that are inherent in being a 25-year-old CEO of a company that's a global brand. Yeah. Um, well, basically, I finished college almost two years early and knew I wanted to come to Silicon Valley. So I actually came out straight from Texas uh, before I could even drink. Um, and and uh, you know, I started at Apple and then Google. And so I actually had... Uh, more years under the, my belt than a typical 25-year-old, uh, two more years. But, but I felt like at that point, I was unmarried. I didn't have children. I had saved enough money um, at those jobs to have six months where I could bootstrap anything I wanted to. And if that didn't work out, I knew that I was probably able to get another job somewhere else um, at a different tech company and be paid an okay salary. So there really wasn't much downside risk for me at the time, and I actually um, encourage a lot of 20-somethings to think about starting a business because it is, you are much more energetic, you know, you have time, you don't have a lot of other dependencies. And, and I think that if you don't do that, especially as women, um, women, are, I think, that are having children are actually pretty afraid of starting a company when their kids are, like, two, um, which I have a two-year-old now and a nine-month-old, and I can't imagine starting a company from scratch right now. So it feels like you either have this window, um, you know, prior to having children or maybe when your children are a few years old, and that time in between is a, is a gray area, not to say it can't be done. I know Julia had little kids running around the office with her when she was younger, but the, the challenges are that you're young, and, and being a female doesn't help either. So I'm pitching mostly old white VC men um, and telling them why my idea is going to work, and and they, you know, nine out of 10 say, I need to ask my daughter or my wife or my assistant what she thinks and I'll get back to you. And um, that sucks. And, and so I think that, you know, that's the biggest challenge is really how you're gonna make money, uh, or sorry, how you're gonna get the money. Um, but if you can bootstrap and you can show that you have graphs that are up and to the right and you have revenue coming in the door and you're hiring some great people initially, um, hopefully you can get that seed round. And then if you keep doing that, maybe you can get the Series A. And, and we really did take it one day at a time. And now, um, over five years later, I think we've proven ourselves enough that you know investors don't look at me like a young little girl anymore, but someone who has started to, to really accomplish something is building a real business. I love it. Speaking of venture financing, there are how many entrepreneurs do we have in the audience? Woohoo! Okay, so it looks like maybe 15, 20% of the audience are entrepreneurs. It's not easy being a woman raising a venture capital round, is it? Miriam, I know that you had to do it twice, right? Yeah. Maybe tell us a little bit about you know, from the perspective of the folks that are trying to raise capital or maybe have an idea and are thinking about raising capital, how'd you go about doing it twice? Okay, Two so for Eve.com, we raised in 98, went right when the, the sort of the market was heating up, the, doc, the first dot-com uh, bubble, and well, I should say boom. It wasn't, it, it turned out it wasn't actually a bubble after all. It turned out it was a very long thing. Um, and then the second time, so far for Minted, we've raised about $90 million. So we've raised so 26 the first time and $90 million this time. 
for the, I guess the first time, and I would say both times we were really affected by market conditions. So knowing the market and knowing exactly where the wind is blowing at any given moment, and it seems to constantly change every couple of months. People are either interested in e-commerce or they're not interested in e-commerce, and it can, can be very frustrating, but get, timing, the, going out at the right time when your business is in favor and when conditions are in your favor really helps. The first time when we went out, it was just a really frothy market in 98. In, in 2007, it was basically almost in, we were raising almost right into the recession. Our first round was raised two weeks before Lehman failed. Um, and really nobody was interested in e-commerce. It was a, a push, like pulled, pushing a boulder uphill. Um, and then of course traction has a lot to do with it. So the second round for Minted, our Series B round, we ended up with a lot of, with, I don't know, a lot of term sheets, a lot of offers because we've shown traction. So it's, it's a little bit of market conditions, how, how, how well your company is, you know, how, is doing, where exactly you are in the proof point. Sometimes people say it's easier to sell hope than reality. So sometimes it's almost easier to sell a, a presentation before you get started in a consumer. It, it just depends on, on, on where you are in the cycle and then obviously kind of acting as if you have half the money you do because it always takes much longer and many, many more cycles to optimize your business and you need a lot of runway to do that. There are so many businesses that have died because of a lack of capital more than any other reason. Just they haven't had enough runway to optimize because you need so many cycles of optimization to make your business work. I think for Minted, I, we started with a 0.1% conversion rate, which is how, what part of your traffic turns into a customers. It was like really, really bad. <laughs> and to the point where we almost shut the business down. I mean, I was really about two months away from just giving all the money back and being like, this is impossible. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> then we started noticing some tiny signs of life in our crowd. We're crowdsourced, meaning people submit to us in design competitions. And we started seeing this tiny little sign of life. Then we um, decided to try to go raise. We managed to save the company, really, by shifting the whole company completely towards crowdsourcing when we weren't originally. But the, um, the uh, we, you know, we almost threw the towel in, and it was a, it was a very close one. Yeah. yeah, and I heard you say in interviews that the key is never give up. You know, that you're reminding yourselves every day that there's more successes than there's failures. There's more opportunity. And you said you were motivated by the fact that you had friends and family. Yeah, I had raised such. my angel around from friends and family, and I just didn't want to lose their capital. And I, I, I'm not sure I would take money again because I was so, I felt so... Um, I guess uh, conscientious about them that I wanted to raise money to, to save their capital, actually. So that's why we ended up going and raising a venture round, a series, a series A. But we took probably we did maybe 50 to 100 changes to the commerce, the checkout pipeline, in order to get our conversion rate wow. from 0.1 percent to like a decent half a percent or 0.75 percent. And then now it's you know multiples of that but it's taken years of like little optimizations of the checkout funnel and how we display products and such to to get there but you need enough capital to 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 do that for a long time that's the that's the key thing. anybody else want to comment about that i mean i know venture capital there certainly is a perception and it's really reality that, that women have a harder time but do you have a, a story well, to relate well you know i i i feel like in some ways, after 10 years of this journey, I'm experiencing some things for the first time as being the CEO of the company and having so much empathy for women who have started their companies or have gone into that, into that position and gone at it alone. Like, I, 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 I really always knew that I had a benefit of a strong partnership, and I'm not, it just, it's just different. It's not better or worse, it's just different. But when we went out to raise, we pitched, I, I will never forget this number, 27 venture firms uh, in 2008. We did, we did do one better. We went out in like the cratered moment of life. We thought that'd be fun. And you know, that's when we really sort of bared our souls and we had so much objection because basically VCs in 2008 were like, their job was just to think of all the reasons why they could say no, because they, they really didn't have any risk to take. And what we did was we left all of them, so we failed, failed. And we left all of them with our 2009 business plan, and we raised a, a bridge with family and friends to stay in existence. 
And in 2009, two things happen. One is we just hit that growth inflection point of people who started using Eventbrite to build businesses when they lost their jobs. So a woman who lost her job at Charles Schwab started a culinary school that now makes six figures on Eventbrite. Um, people started to gather around trying to find jobs and network, and that started to take off. So we started to see these really, these sort of green shoots of an economy that existed in live experiences that really did start taking off in 2009. And then we beat our plan. And so when we are able to go back exactly a year later, it was a totally different dynamic because we did what we said we'd do. And I was astonished by how much, how much weight that held. Um, and we started to see this really interesting uh, sort of set of trends occur. And then we had our choice of term sheets. So we were able to go with Sequoia Capital, which what had been our, our number one choice. And uh, I just, I found that, that to be such an interesting experience because then after, it was like me too rounds. So once we were sort of signed, sealed, and delivered by Sequoia, a couple of other firms wanted in. And then we met uh, Tiger and they were really interested in our business. And then that, so it was almost like the capital didn't come exactly easy after that, but it definitely came a lot easier than that first yes. Yeah. And just getting that first yes took a year. I mean, more than a year. Yeah, and uh, do you think Capital, and maybe there's lots of other reasons, but I'd like to hear each one of you comment on this. Why aren't there more women like you starting technology companies? Uh, the latest data is that 8% of tech founders and CEOs are women, just 8%. And it's worse in the Valley. It's only 3% in the Valley. Can you imagine that? 3% in the Valley. So why, why aren't more women starting technology firms, right? You guys are all competent, capable. You've been able to raise capital. You've had success. What's the, what's the problem, Britt? There aren't enough female venture capitalists <laughs> is one problem. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm serious. I think, you know, the, the same the response of, like, I'm going to have my daughter look at this and I'll get back to you. Like, it just doesn't resonate as so well when you're talking to a man. And, and I, I, like, actually don't like playing the female card and, like, talking about this a lot, but it, it's true. And, and so when you see a woman like, like Jess Lee, who, you know, sold Polyvore and now has joined Sequoia, um, I'm like thrilled that there is somebody in there championing any women's idea, you know, whether it's women specific or it's just a female who's the CEO and pitching a concept, like there's a, probably a different mentality. And I know everyone says they treat everyone equally, but you have to, you have to think that like, I'm marketing a product and I'm pitching a product that is for an 18 to 35 year old woman. You are a 60 year old man. There's probably not gonna be a lot that you understand <laughs> about why this is an issue. So um, I do think that the, the pipeline issue is real. I agree. This is why I started the diversity fund at Intel Capital, because it's so true. Let me just reiterate this point. And, uh, oh, it's so true. When we put the shingle on the door that says, we have a $125 million fund to invest in women and minority-led technology startups, we got 600 business plans, right? So the common theme or the common perception on Sand Hill Road and in the venture capital industry is there just aren't enough women who have great ideas to start companies. Now, how is it then we, when we announced that we were doing this fund, we got 600 business plans. So you're out there, but you can't get the money. And that is largely true. These three women are exceptional. And they are exceptions also. So I agree. I think more women on our side of the table would help tremendously. Because one, you know how to find those women that are entrepreneurs. Two, you're credible to that audience. Three, you can understand what it is they're producing, what they're making. And, and I think there's just a common ground, right? Where you're gonna have a little more faith, a little more confidence. So I agree 100% with that point. I wanna open up the, uh, the panel to questions. So we do have some mics um, in the middle and we have volunteers that can help bring a mic to you. So be thinking about a question. I'm gonna ask one or two more questions, but feel free to step up to the mic if you want to ask a question for one of the ladies. 
All right, so tell me, what are the things, if you had to do, that you would do differently? Julia, start. I mean, this is so easy. I would get all the sleep back that I lost over the competitors in our space. So at last count, there are 3,000 ticketing companies in the world, uh, probably more, but the ones that we've sized, 3,000. And Kevin and I would, ex excuse the term, we'd get our panties in a wad over every single one of them. When we would lose sleep, we would be really worried about it. And I remember thinking, I think it was Mark Zuckerberg who said, um, you can't focus, you can't look behind you if you're trying to go as fast as you can in front of you. And I remember thinking like, that's really interesting. And then getting to this place where we can definitively say we're number one in events, number one in organizers, number three in ticket volume. And it's like, okay, now what, right? So it's a totally different problem set, which is really exciting, except for the fact that I want all the sleep back that I lost. And so I think that the moral of the story is that you, whether it's a competitive set in your industry or a competitor to your job, you have to stay focused on what you bring to the table and your value proposition and get some sleep. Like, you know, it, it's really not worth losing sleep over. It's, it's worth having the intel, but 100% that stands out beyond anything that I would do differently is I wouldn't have worried so much about competitors. I like it. Any other strong testimony? Britt, you give I, us yours. I, I mean, it's, a, it's a, an emotional battle. Um, and the first two years probably are the hardest. And uh, you don't just have a good day or a bad day. You have about 18 goods and 18 bads all on the same day. And so if you aren't good with managing the highs and the lows, um, you're going to be an emotional wreck. And when it's the first time you're doing it, it's really hard. Um, I was the really annoying girl in school who had the perfect attendance, straight A president of the class, like that annoying girl. And so I wasn't used to having like bad days and failures and dealing with people drama and HR issues. Like, and, and, um, and so I had to had to like learn how to stabilize and and after that I sort of feel like the, the bad part is I'm just an apathetic person now I don't have any emotion um, but but I can run a business really effectively so so there's some success that came from it <laughs> excellent okay we have a question please say your name and your company I don't think this is oh great hi my name is Stephanie Lampkin I'm the founder and CEO of Lindor <laughs> another entrepreneur um, we're recruiting technology that mitigates unconscious bias in hiring. Uh, so to date, I've only been able to raise $160,000 in outside capital. And I'm not sure if you heard the statistic, there are actually only about 15 African-American women in the world that have raised a million dollars or more. And the fundamental problem of that is oftentimes we don't have the friends and family, right? I was born to a homeless single mother. I've never met my father. I don't have rich uncles. So what would be your recommendation for sort of getting this family and friends round that ties us over to series A so that we have the leeway to optimize and fail and iterate and get to that point where our 0.1% turns into 0.75%, et cetera? Good question. Um, I'll start, but I would say congratulations, at least in the 160 to start, you're off to the races. Um, and, and it's crazy, those statistics are insane. I, I do think that there are some really interesting new platforms that help you raise money. AngelList is, I think, phenomenal, and now that they have AngelList syndicates, um, you're seeing literally multi-million dollar investments or hundreds of thousands of dollars of investments going into companies. Um, also, just getting known. So Product Hunt is another platform um, that you can put your product on and get if, you know, if your friends and family don't have money, at least they can like and upvote things. Um, and that gets a lot of intracapitalist attention where you can potentially get a, a meeting. Um, and lastly, never rule out the cold tweet. It's the new cold call. Um, and if you can attach a, an image of a chart um, that has your metrics moving up and to the right, then that can get people's attention too. But I think a lot of it comes down to a sort of hustle, like getting in front of people. My husband is an entrepreneur turned venture capitalist, as is yours now, actually. Actually. And, and so we, we've both seen the side of um, what the entrepreneurial life is like and now what the venture life is like. And 
And if you find a way to get a deck in front of these people, like they will look at it. Um, so it's a matter of making those connections. So I would just say, if your friends, and, you know, try the Angel List route, even Kickstarter, Product Hunt, all of those things. And if if you if that doesn't work, like try your hardest to just network the hell out of yourself and get to these people who can write checks. It's such a great. I mean, whoa, that's that is in itself something you should be writing, aggregating because actually you're right that those things. I don't mean to sound like an old timer, but those actually didn't exist when we were raising money. And so in some senses, there's a democratization of capital, like sort of in that, in that sort of seed stage. And there's so many new platforms that you can expose your product or your service or your idea on. And that's exciting. And I think it hasn't quite completely solved the issue of getting beyond 160K but it's so exciting to think about the fact that it could, and I think that's the purpose, and that didn't exist even a decade ago. And it could even be your customers. I mean, I think getting outside the system, if the system's not working, go around the system, I think. You know, just go around the system and, yeah. and um, yeah. break it yeah. out into the, your customers and, your, and, your, and, and, the, and the public. And I, and I would add to that, agree 100%, leverage communities like this. We're fundraising, so I'm, I'm at Wesley Group now, a private venture capital firm, and we're fundraising. I didn't ever had to raise a penny while I was at Intel Capital, right? We had 50 billion or so in the bank, and we invested off of Intel's balance sheet, right? Not a bad gig if you can get it. So never had to fundraise. But I have been pretty surprised at my ability to develop a community of people that know people that know folks that have money. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It really is that simple. Because, you know, again, never had to raise a, a penny. But now I'm about to close my first $25 million LP investment. And I have been, and I'm telling you, I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm exceptional and uh, in, in, in particularly talented at that. But I know so many people. And you will be amazed if you ask for help or you ask somebody, if they know somebody that could help, ask, ask, ask. You will get people to answer. I mean, I, I, I knew nobody in the fund of funds world, nobody in the institutional money world, no, no family offices, no really, no real wealthy individuals. Uh, I didn't know these folks. And yet I've been able to, to leverage the community of folks that I know to find the right people they endorse and it's been amazing. So I'd say work the community. This is why organizations like Upward are so important because it creates a community for you to reach out to people that you might normally not ever see. So really important. So you, your question. Sure. Hi, I'm Zainab, and I'm currently building product at a startup called Finn, and I also run a nonprofit on the side called Woe Grammar, where we tell inspiring stories about women engineers and leaders to break stereotypes. So we've interviewed over 150 women from all over the world, every continent, including Antarctica. And uh, we ask women simply the same questions that men are asked. And what we found is the hardest question for women to answer, whether it was a CEO of a company or whether it was a high school student building like a video game in a backyard, uh, was what are you most proud of? So to the panel, uh, I want to ask two questions. One is, what are you most proud of? And second, how do you overcome challenges? Julia gets to start. Oh boy. Um, I am, so I'll tell you the two things that came to mind first because I think that's probably authentic before I edit them. I am most proud of stepping into a role that was previously filled by my life partner and work through the transition of not actually working with my life partner side by side for the first time in 10 years. So I took his role, or yeah, I am now the CEO of Eventbrite, and I am also um, not working side by side with him, and I thought that would be the end of us. And so I'm, I'm proud in the back of my head, and I'm proud of working through that with him and realizing that we're impervious to those types of, uh, you know, changes in environment and changes in sort of format. And I'm proud of how I have stepped up into that role because it, it was a lot harder than I thought it'd be. 
And how I overcome challenges is I try to get out of my own way and sort of, you called it apathy, but what I've realized is that there is a part of you that has to kind of like shut down the voices. And I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Inside Out, but I mean, that explained everything to me. I was like, oh my God. And so I have to shut the people off. I'm like, no, 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 I know you're freaking out right now, but you gotta just chill. And so I give them like edibles and then we're fine. Um, I don't actually eat edibles, mom. I'm just saying the people in my head do. Um, but just shutting your, like shutting down the doubt and really stopping the, the self-doubt and then just looking at it holistically and good old resilience and grit is just amazing. I think, I think the great Tina Fey said, being a working mom is, seems impossible and then you keep doing the impossible day after day and then you realize that you just kind of do, you're just doing it. And so, um, and so just to end this really great monologue, I'll say like a, another great Disney, Disney movie, Dory, you know, just keep swimming. You just kind of keep swimming and you get, you get through it. So that's how I overcome the challenges. I feel like I want to drop the mic now. Everything you needed to learn. <laughs> Right. Just go watch Disney My movies mom. if you want to be an entrepreneur, is the moral of your story. <laughs> I have never been on a panel where two cartoons have been referenced <laughs> in business dialogue. I have, I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old girl. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love down. it. I love it. Okay, good. Next question. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Elizabeth Hilton with GE Ventures, and I have a question about hiring, because I'm sure you've done a fair amount of recruiting and hiring, especially when you're really concerned about the culture early on of your small startup. So what, what are you looking for when you're hiring people? What qualities? Oh, boy. Well, I, yeah, I'd love to talk about that one. Um, I think that um, number one would be the capacity to learn and to keep learning, um, because then I think it just means the person has limitless potential. So no matter what ends up happening and what twists and turns come their way on the, on the path of, of, of any company, frankly, small, medium, large, the, en the endless, endlessly curious person who looks like they have a huge capacity to learn can figure out what the solution's going to be and can adapt. And I think that shows that they've got potential to go into <clears throat> into senior leadership as well. So they've got this endless potential. So number one would be learning. Um, I think we, ha we all probably have a set of cultural values. I would say we at Minted have certain things that we look for that fit with us. And for us, it's transparency, results orientation, a certain amount of humility. Um, those are the kinds of things that we really value. But I'm sure everyone has their different corporate values. Um, we, um, we are a company that is a largely female executive team. And so we have created a company. Yeah, it's really awesome, actually. It's, one of the, if, if, it's actually one of the things I'm very proud of is that we've created an environment where we're a successful company taking huge amounts of market share from um, male-led companies, frankly. <laughs> uh, huge amounts of market share. And, um, and it's, it's actually a very male printing industry that we work with. Um, but it's a female, it's a female-led company, and it's a very diverse management team in all respects. Actually, in, in every respect, it's a very diverse team. Um, but for us, you know, being able to respect uh, diversity is also an important value for us. Being able to work with other people collaboratively, no matter what their background. I love it. Okay, last question. Well, uh, so, so Miriam just answered my question, but I'll ask it of the other two panelists. Um, Amy Vernetti, I'm the Director of Leadership Recruiting for the Moonshots and Bets at Alphabet. And my question is, do you guys have diverse executive teams? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, if 80% female is diverse, then yes, we also have an African American, an Indian, and an Asian person on our executive team. So yes, um, and our 80 board, eighty percent eighty percent eighty. Um, our board is also eighty percent female as well. We have five board members; four of them are women. So I'm still digesting your title and what you do because that's so cool. I see. Yeah. Whoa. Um, 63% uh, female executive team, a 
50-50 split on, on the company for the last seven years, which has been awesome. Um, and we're a global company, so we have, uh, we have diversity in the US, but we also have this really interesting embedded diversity throughout the globe. So we have 11 offices on four different, or sorry, <laughs> We just acquired a company. We have 14 offices in 11 countries on four continents. And what I'm trying to do is not only locally address where we can keep pushing diversity of thought and not just rest on our laurels as saying, oh, well, we're one of the few tech companies of scale that's 50-50. Like, that's not good enough, right? So where can we keep pushing and creating this inclusive environment and now more than ever really feeling the need for that. But then also how do you leverage the idea of a truly global company? One of the things that Kevin and I and Renault, our, our third co-founder, have always been really passionate about is just the power of the global talent base and how different that is from a US-centric company. We can make all sorts of jokes about that now, but it, you know we've been doing that for, we've been building this global, global aspect for the entire life cycle of Eventbrite. And seeing how that informs decision making and thoughtfulness and a broad perspective, um, not only is it sometimes like sort of sanity inducing, but it's also, it's also really important to just constantly be thinking at, about things from different perspectives. And we'll think we have a great idea and then we'll realize that a huge customer base somewhere in the world thinks that that is the most awful feature, you know, that we could possibly. And so it's just that con consistent diversity and and um, of thought and opinion and, and different perspectives that I think is so important. But we are so not done uh, in terms of continuing to push on creating a diverse and inclusive environment. But I do feel like we've created a place where you can be whoever you want to be and where we accept the entire person, not just the employee. I love it. Excellent. <laughs> Give this panel a big hand. <laughs> I know, nobody wants to get up because the seats are very comfortable up here. A really big hand, really. Aren't they exceptional? All right, thank you.